Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is representation theory. Today, I would like to tell you about the beginnings of maybe the most important part of representation theory of finite groups, a character theory. So what are characters? So historically speaking, it's kind of fun. So when Frobenius invented representation theory about 120 years ago, 125 years ago, something like that, um, actually it was all character theory and the notion of a representation in that sense was uh, developed a bit later and uh, nowadays the exposition is kind of different you would first explain representations and then those characters which are really kind of polynomials associated to representations it's kind of a fun idea which i will go into uh, some details uh, this talk and then we will continue because it's really just ridiculously beautiful and powerful as well so very surprising that it actually works so nice uh, in the end, it, it's so smooth, it's it's ridiculous. It really, really is ridiculous. But first, let's have a look at my wish list here. So, um, so the idea of invariance, so it's like a numerical data associated to more complicated stuff, uh, or more complicated whatever notions in mathematics or sciences in general, is actually um, pretty widespread. So instead of carrying a huge bag of very complicated notion, you associate to them basically a number if you want and the numbers behave nicely with respect to whatever kind of notion you had originally. Um, and usually the number um, is kind of a very nice way to tell those things apart, but it usually doesn't determine it. So uh, for example, it would be an Euler characteristic or something. And well, why not do that in representation theory? So here's my wish list to each representation. Okay, I want an associated numerical invariant and Numerical invariant, I'd be, well, well, very generous here, something like a number, right? So instead of having a representation, let's say a representation is quite a lot of datum. So uh, if you have a uh, group of order 10 acting on a 12 dimensional space, you would have 10 12 by 12 matrices to carry around. And if you now have a group of order 1 million and two acting on a 12 million dimensional vector space, it's quite a lot of data you carry around. So having a number instead of huge matrices is probably better. And of course, as I just said, this, not, this number, this invariant should be nice with respect to operation on representations, right? So representations come with a natural set of operations you can perform. And it would be really, really good if uh, this invariant behaves nicely. We'll see what that means. And then, well, <laughs> the last point, the invariant should determine the representation. And this is just, I mean, yeah, it's a wish list. It's a wish list, but this really sounds impossible. And it almost never happens to come back to that. So the really the last point is it, 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 it's a it's what makes this theory so beautiful because it actually works. So my wish list, it, it's it's possible to, to find such an invariant such my wish list works, which is ridiculous. Uh, in particular, the last a point is very, very strange. Let me say it again. Instead of what I'm trying to do here, what I'm trying to find is instead of having uh, whatever, 10, 12 by 12 matrices, I just have a few numbers and those numbers are equivalent to my 10, 12 by 12 matrices, which is ridiculous. This is just can't work, right? But it will. And that's kind of the, the fun about representation theory in the end. And that's why it makes it, that's why it is so smooth because instead of having huge matrices, we just have a few numbers and they determine one another. And it's really, really beautiful. Okay, so let's have a look what we actually can do. So you want to have something that kind of mimics what representations can do. Representations are matrices. Um, you have nice formulas for could multiply representations. Uh, you can add representations um, and so on. So what kind of invariant, numerical invariant associated to a matrix could do the job? And the idea is to just take the trace. So here you take the trace of this matrix here, it's 150. And the end result, I can already, I can already spoil the end result, is that this number will determine the matrix, which is very ridiculous, because as you can see, the other numbers are not even involved in this matrix. So in general, there's just no hope that the trace, the sum of all diagonal elements, could determine the matrix, right? You can't even determine the diagonal elements left aside the off-diagonal elements from the trace. Uh, but it will work. And trace really is like, it's really like polynomials with an addition operation that behaves nicely with respect to addition. You have a multiplication operation and behaves nicely with respect to multiplication. So maybe the trace is the correct object to look at in particular 
uh, of course, because of the cyclicity property, maybe not of course, but because of the cyclicity property, traces are actually invariant under base change, because I could just, if I would do a base change, something like uh, APP inverse, I could just pull this P over because it's cyclic, right? Trace is really just this picture that you have uh, two boxes, A and B, and you can just pull them around. So this is A and this is B, and you can just take box B and pull it around and put it at the bottom for box A. This is really just this property. It's kind of my diagrammatic way of illustrating this property. Anyway, so if you do this with um, the base change, you will see actually it's invariant under base change. Really, really simple. So it behaves like a polynomial. It's invariant under base change. It kind of has the natural operations of representations built in, and it's a number. So maybe you should actually try traces. And well, spoiler, spoiler, yeah, that will work. It's just very surprising. We'll see. Um, so let's have a look at my permutation representation again. So the permutation representation and the standard representation were just the X on the triangle. So here, let me just do one of them as an example. Uh, maybe this one here. So this one is a permutation representation. So if I want like to think of my uh, endpoints of the triangle as being the numbers one, two, three, so my basis vectors, then this would send number one, so here, to point number three, so it should end here, be down here, and indeed it does. It says two to one, so green should go all the way to the top, perfect. And well, there's only one spot uh, left for blue, of course, uh, so it should send three to one. So this is how those matrices work. And as I explained in the previous video, if you get rid of the obvious eigenvector of the system, you get the so-called standard representation. And I wrote down the uh, the matrices for the standard representation as well. Okay, and getting rid of this eigenvector really just means that the permutation representation is a trivial representation. So the eigenvector, everything acts as one. That's a trivial representation uh, plus the standard representation. Okay, well, that's nice. So it's really just permutation uh, equals to trivial plus standard and the notation here is again, the L's are the symbols and the V's are not necessarily simple. So permutation is not a simple representation. As you can see, it's a direct sum. So it's not simple, trivial plus standard. Okay, so now you check traces, okay? So first matrix has trace three, uh, two, and trivial one is always trace one. So three, two, one, um, just in a different order. Uh, no, sorry, the order was supposed to be this way. Um, so standard and trivial, so the second entry is trivial. So the second entry is always the trace of the trivial one, and this should be always one. Uh, well, it's a trivial representation. The first is a trace of the upper matrix of permutation. So three, one, 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 uh, then zero, 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 as you can see here, zero and zero, and then one again. Um, yeah, perfect one again. And the last entry is, well, uh, two, as you can see, uh, zero, 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 zero. Uh, what do we have here? Minus one, minus one, and zero minus one, minus one, and zero. Very nice. And now observe that the trace that satisfies this property. So trace of permutation is trace of trivial plus trace of standard. So three is one plus two, one is one plus zero, one is one plus zero, zero is one plus minus one, zero is one plus minus one. Yeah, absolutely. Zero is one plus minus one, and one is one plus zero. So the traces actually already seem to capture the decomposition um, on the, of the representations without really remembering the matrices, right? The traces, just the traces, capture already the decomposition. And that's amazing. <laughs> and that's actually true in general. So a character then is really just defined as follows. So a character is just uh, your associated number to each group element, fine. And they're usually denoted by chi. So chi, character of a representation, is your associated group element to a number and is just a trace of the corresponding uh, uh, representation. So it's really a number instead of a matrix. It's a huge simplification. That's how it looks like. And the properties is the invariance. It's really easy to see. So if the representations are equivalent, I should have written equivalent, then the characters are the same. That's great. So it has the additive property. Direct sums are turned into addition of characters. 
Um, that's what I showed you here on this side. So direct sum was turned into addition of characters, or addition of phrases. I haven't showed you this one, but it also works. So the tensor product of representation is turned into the multiplication of characters. And then there's this beautiful, extremely beautiful result, which sadly only holds really over C, is that um, the character determines the representation. So here we, the arrow goes in this direction. So it's invariant, but it actually uh, also the other way around. And this should be a correlate again. So um, the characters are the same if and only if, over C, the characters are the same if and only if the representations are the same. And this is just really saying that this numerical invariant that forgets all about matrices and just remembers traces is actually as strong as the representation itself. What a ridiculously beautiful and surprising result. I don't know. I can't, I can't, I really, it's so good. I just have nothing more to say about it. It's just so ridiculously good. And the invariant is actually more efficient, even more efficient. So um, you already saw that somehow on this slide. So those two and this one, uh, this one is by itself. And um, I guess those two here um, have the same associated traces. They have the same associated character. And actually characters are constant on conjugacy clauses. And you don't even need to remember numbers for all group elements. You just need to remember numbers for all conjugacy classes and the symmetric group in this example has three conjugacy classes, uh, representatives given by those elements. And as those just, these are just the traces in this case. So we have seen standard representation, for example, and we have seen trivial representation. Um, so there's also the sign representation, which I haven't showed you. And as you can see in this table, they're all different, right? So the character determines the representation and even more, if you would have something that is built out of those, there's the building blocks, there's the elements, right? Um, you could still determine just by looking at the character which pieces you have. And this is just, I mean, this is ridiculous. I say it again because it's so beautiful. So instead of having a huge matrix, a huge system of matrices, one for each group element, you just have a number, one for each conjugacy class. And that's actually the same amount of information, which is kind of ridiculous with a slight caveat that you need to work over C to have it really the same amount of information. This is, I can't stress it often enough. This is really, really amazing and it just it has no words. It's just so good. For example, a classical example of an invariant would be Euler characteristic. Uh, very often you will find something that the Euler characteristic is just the same here for my, for my torus, for my donut. And this is a, supposed to be a Klein bottle. So uh, the very famous Klein bottle. Euler characteristic is the same, but certainly, so these are just numbers. It's just, it's just the equation zero equals zero, but um, those two surfaces are certainly not the same. So this is the character determines the representation. Would the analog in topology would be the Euler characteristic determines the manifold, which is very, very, very far from being true. So this is really a miracle. And it's only true, for, well, well, it's not only true, but uh, the, the main, a uh, list of examples where it's two are finite groups over the complex numbers, which I still want to call uh, the finite group miracle. It really is a miracle. And I've there's almost no analog of this in other fields of mathematics. It's just ridiculously, it's a ridiculously good idea and ridiculously strong result. Anyway, I hope you really like characters. So just traces associated to matrices, uh, at least over finite, for finite groups over complex numbers, they carry the same amount of information. And I should say that um, in those cases, it's actually possible to reconstruct the representation from the character. So this is really possible. Usually people don't do that because it's a bit tricky, but it, it is possible to reconstruct the whole representation just from knowing the characters, which is, Really, really surprising result. Remember that we only remember, uh, recall that we only remember traces of elements and you can reconstruct the whole matrix. And this is just, why on earth should that be true, right? This is just horribly false in any other field of mathematics, basically. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.